if two people have to take a look at something and and uh, for good accounting control, it has to go through two people over a certain dollar amount, you can leverage that workflow so well in bill.com and save yourself a lot of mailing back and forth and questions. Welcome to the AI in Accounting podcast. Now, here's your host, Joshua Feinberg of Vic.ai. So Tina, thanks so much for joining me today. But I wanted to start with learning a little bit more about um, early growth financial services and your role within the company, how you, how you progressed, how you ended up in your current role. Um, so what, sure. can you give us a little bit of, of history? Uh, yeah, I'll give you a brief history. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, thank you. And thanks for this opportunity to talk with you. It's great to see you thank again. You. Um, early growth's been you know, in operation for over 11 years. So we saw the last downturn too. Um, and I've worked, you know, my whole life in, um, in operations, in, a, you know, in accounting and operations, uh, director of investor relations for some public companies. Um, and, you know, the, the, the operations part is very, is very much focused on really good processes to save time. And more importantly than just saving time is to be accurate. And, you know, when, when you've got that background in operations, you start to realize how important it is to do things right the first time. And anything that can help you do that you know, is better for you and is, is going to have better results for, you know, your stakeholder, whether it's the next department, if you're in a manufacturing environment, or it's your client, if you're in accounting. So um, I've worked for, you know, more years than I want to count as an operating CFO, and I'm currently um, the a, a consulting CFO and the systems manager for early growth. So I hope that's uh, helpful. Yeah, no, no, it definitely is. So uh, Today, I want to talk a little bit more about how you use Bill.com, how your clients use Bill.com. Mm -hmm. how, how did you originally decide to use that as part of your uh, core platform, as part of your core tech, oh, tech stack? Wow. Great question. Um, Bill.com is literally one of the very first systems that early growth um, solidified around. Um, we're very much focused on um, our, our firm, you know, understands that every client has a unique profile, you know, so it's not just a standard stack that we put together for every single client. We design the systems around the client's needs, what industries they're in, their product life cycle, the, the um, organization's life cycle. But we did find early on, there are certain platforms that, that are just, they have very well built workflows, just really insightful, thorough. And it's kind of like, I like to call it the difference between an app and a platform, right? Um, an app can do one thing and it does it great. But then the, you know, the actual platform does the function and everything af affiliated with that function very well. And we found that build.com really did meet those, um, those needs, both on the AP and on the AR side. Because you know, in accounting, as you know, it's very important for us to have visibility, very important for us to have really good accounting controls. And then critically important is that we have to have systems that seamlessly integrate with other key systems. And build.com just met all of those requirements from from inception and it continues to you know it continues to advance its capabilities but this is going back you know as i say long i've been with early growth for about seven years and, and bill.com was there before me so um definitely a really impressive workflow and that's what we look at awesome what would you say is the your favorite tip that you would give to somebody that's just getting started with bill.com something that you've encountered over the years that a lot of people that are new may not know about Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I think the key thing, two key things, can I say two? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, the first one is, you know, systems are meant and they're designed to sync together. So um, really important is to make sure that you go through the setup process with bill.com, you do that first sync, so you pull in the chart of accounts, go through bill.com's process. It's very thorough and it'll set you up for success. So for a beginner, that's my number one tip. Um, the second tip, it seems really obvious, but it's also like, I think very important. Be sure if you're a beginner that you're reconciling the bill.com accounts, bill.com money in and money out every month as part of your monthly close process. Not because the system's going to make a mistake and not because you're going to make a mistake, but it's just to keep everything aligned. And I, I, I do see a lot of folks that don't do that. And then, you know, three or four months down the line, it's like, Man, I think I avoided that check, and now I've got this imbalance. You know, the the account should not be out of balance. So those are my, if I can have two, those are my two, my two recommendations. So two favorite tips for beginners is to start by syncing up everything, and then making sure that you're always reconciling what's coming in and coming out monthly. 
Exactly. On a monthly basis, just make it part of your monthly close process. Just like you, just like you reconcile a bank account, you reconcile your pay, PayPal account, reconcile your bill.com accounts. If you're using, you know, and do both because bill.com is AR and AP. So make sure those things are, are reconciled. Cool. So at the other end of the spectrum, if you're at a conference and you're giving a session to bill.com power users. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, what, what's one of the more interesting tips, workarounds, um, way to get more out of the platform that you've discovered over, out of the year, over the years that someone that's been using bill.com for three, four, five years or more may not know about? Good, good question. Um, a couple of things. First, you know, definitely leverage the approvals workflow that's available in bill.com. So that you can, you know, you can literally set up if, if two people have to take a look at something and, and uh, for good accounting control, it has to go through two people over a certain dollar amount, you can leverage that workflow so well in bill.com and save yourself a lot of mailing back and forth and questions. Um, so that's number one. The, number two is the ability in bill.com to switch the order of the bills. You know, sometimes you get a, somebody enters or scans in a bunch of bills or sends in and the last page comes first. Sometimes, you know, you, you dump that in and the approver's like, oh, I can't tell what you put in here. Make sure you can order the pages and you can select the pages right on bill.com uh, that you want to include when you're entering a bill. Definitely leverage that. Um, the other thing I would for a power user the other thing I would recommend is if you're using bill.com in conjunction with um, a manufacturing or an inventory system, take a really close look at whether you want two-way or one-way sync. Normally, you're going to want one-way sync because there's item receipts coming in. So really do a good job of, of setting that up with your inventory system and understand the interface between the two. Okay. And then, la and this is another one. And then the last one I would say is if you're a power user, absolutely. If you can set up a system where you've got one repository for, you know, every, for an expense submission and tracking, another repository for everything that's being paid out of the company, literally everything and use bill.com for that. And then sync everything over into your master accounting system. The reason to do that, boy, at the end of the year, when you've got to file 1099s, all you do is you go into your, whatever 1099 platform you're using. And you can literally just download, you know, sync over, download the bill.com information. If you've done a good job of keeping your W9 and vendor numbers in there, and you've done a good job of, you know, putting EXP in front of a, an ex, something that's a reimbursement, your 1099 process is so much simpler than trying to use it in the master accounting system. Because bill.com is keeping track of what yeah. went out exactly. on, on, on the, on the uh, AP side. They are on the AP side. I, and also, you know, with bill.com, you've got, your vendors can change their bank information themselves. It's not like they've got to come to me and I've got to change it. So they also, in that case, could upload, you know, W9s, let you know their address changed, let you know their business name may have changed. You better get another W9. So um, yeah, because of that capability and the direct communication line inside of bill.com, because you can write to the vendor and say, hey, I need a new W9, you know. Uh, those capabilities for power users, I think, are very, very helpful. It, time savers, again, just really leveraging the built-in workflow in the platform. It sounds like the, the tip as well about the manufacturing systems and inventory yeah. tracking systems would be hugely helpful, too, to make sure that you understand who's like the master on the data. Exactly, Joshua, exactly. We've seen, you know, it's, it's not that there's issues, but, you know, the more systems that have to talk to each other, the more you have to start looking at what the impact of the, of the sinks and the flows of information are going to look like. So I'd say probably 80% of the time, if we're, if we're syncing up with an inventory system and we're using bill.com, we're going to really want to look at maybe moving to a one-way sync so that, you know, the, the, the uh, accounting, the master accounting system is the one that is governing the data. Right. Because, again, like I said, if you if you've got this corollary inventory system out there, it's sending over item receipts. And unless you're really, you know, if, unless you're really paying attention to what's coming over into your other systems, there can be mistakes made. So how do you figure this out with a new client? And this is kind of your uh, exploratory uh -huh. process workflow. Is there like an audit that you go through initially? How do you really figure out question. what's the right answer? Yeah, no, it's exactly what you said. It's, it's kind of like an audit. We, we have an onboarding call. You know, we, we make sure we have the benefit, just probably as your company does, of always having some conversations before we engage with a client. So we have a kind of an idea of what their structure is, what their focus is, what their challenges are. Um, but then we also have an onboarding call. And right on that onboarding call, we're live discussing and setting up systems, whether it's a system already in place that the client's using and we need to figure out how that's going to work with other systems 
or if we're doing a raw clean setup and you know we have mixes of both or partial or sometimes a transition a system that's really just not working very well or or maybe spreadsheets that aren't working real well <laughs> Um, so during that process, you know, we are looking at, okay, you're going to use this particular, you know, general ledger system as your master system. You're going to use build.com for AP and AR or just AP and that's platform. You're going to use fill in the blank and other system for expenses where you're manufacturing, you know, satellites. And so you do need a complex inventory management, you know, procure to pay system, essentially use the pay part with build.com, but all, if you're using the procurement, Let's make sure that that system's talking with all the other systems we've got associated that are relevant. You know, the expense system, that's not going to be relevant, but for sure bill.com is going to be relevant. And for sure, your, obviously your accounting system is because you're going to be doing valuation and cost of goods sold project, you know, costing on that system. So that's when we would figure out, okay, we've got this client is using um, a manual inventory system. We need to move into something that's, you know, a little more advanced. Oh, but we want to use bill.com as well. So we have to make sure that those systems can talk to each other in a way that the client can manage and understand and the way that the client can scale. That's the other thing we're always looking for, Joshua, is ability to scale. And the best systems that scale are the ones that integrate well with other systems, right? So there's no switching. Oh, I've got to go now to the big intermediate system. So that's another important consideration and something we do address right in the onboarding process because we know our clients are going to be successful for the most part. And um, they have to scale rapidly. We can't have these, you know, stop steps in between. Yeah, I noticed that there's a video right on your homepage and the, the, the case study, the testimonial from the client actually mentioned specifically scaling faster. Yeah. I don't remember what the company's name was, but. It's really help and, and that's really important. I mean, right now it doesn't seem so important. Current economic environment scale is probably the last thing people are thinking about, but um, you know, in the longer, in the longer term, you can really leverage good systems with good built-in workflows like build.com. You can really leverage those for a very long time without moving to a bulky, maybe sometimes even overbuilt and very expensive enterprise or ERP system. So our goal is always to be able to scale seamlessly and cost efficiently. So another related question is when you are doing onboarding and you're taking over a client that may have been working with somebody else before that originally set up bill.com, what's the biggest mistake that you see that other accounting or finance professionals make when they're setting bill.com up for one of their clients? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's just a, um, it may be, um, the one that we see that seems to be most troublesome is when we have clients that may have been working with someone else that have not integrated the systems, Joshua. So we'll occasionally have a client that's using bill.com, but it's not synced to their accounting system. They're using it as like a standalone system, which it can be, which you can do. And because that's how flexible that system is. But um, the problem with that is then you've got all of these records, right, that have never been synced or worked together. So it's a lot of work to historically go back and make, you know, pick a point where you're going to start the integration, go back and make sure that you're not duplicating anything. So we do see that um, very frequently, actually. The other um, issue we see is, as I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion here, we see where sometimes it's not been reconciled properly. So they'll be like floating things out there, voided checks or, you know, returned items that never really got washed out properly between build.com and the master accounting system. So we have to clean that up. Um, but uh, besides that, even, even when a client or another firm hasn't fully leveraged build.com properly or haven't leveraged it to its fullest extent, because it's such a robust system, we can usually you know, make it, get it to the point where it needs to be and make sure that it works really seamlessly going forward. And that again, speaks to the design of the system. So it sounds like it's a combination of not having the point in time correctly of when the cutover is going to be made. It sounds like some of it not being meticulous enough about reconciling on a regular basis, which goes back to one of the tips you mentioned earlier with the power users. Yeah. Yeah, so that, make, that makes a lot of sense. So if you think kind of at a macro level, if you look at like early, early growth financial services, thinking about your overall uh, business strategy, outsourced to accounting firms, outsourced CFO firms, what do they do? What do you see as the biggest opportunity going forward for a firm like yours to be able to leverage Bill.com as part of its core, core stack, its core uh, toolkit that it uses with clients? That's a great question. Um, I, I think the, the, 
right now, and, and that's your question is so well timed. Um, because right now, where a lot of our focus is, because we're all of us are uncertain as to the length or depth of the current economic downturn. And so it's really important right now to have a lot of visibility into your uh, into your vendor obligations, into your the structure of your uh, how your vendors are structuring their terms, um, all of your expenses and all of your outflows. And so. Uh, Bill.com lets you have that visibility and lets you collaborate on the platform. Like I said, you've got you've got group approvals. So in the group approval process, right, I can like task someone at the client or in, on my team. Hey, you know what? We need to look at every single expense here and every single contract we're paying. So at the $500 level, you are doing all the approvals. I want you to take a, a really tough, tough eye on every expense that you're that you're putting through for approval. And let me know the ones that we might be able to decrease, cut, pause, whatever it is. With a with a with a payables and even an AR system, I'll, I'll get to the AR part next. But we're talking right now about visibility into cash into your cash obligations. With a platform like Bill.com, you can do that very effectively. On the AR side, the other thing, again, because of the current economic conditions, and even you know when things when things do get better, um, we, we do want our clients to be trying to pull forward revenues, right? So if they, if they make it easy, if they give an, enough easy ways for their customers to pay them, which Bill.com enables as well, you can pay on Bill.com no cost to the payer, right? Even a very large invoice, and we pay 49 cents or whatever the, the fee is, right? So we can pull forward, right, our receivables. We can see where our receivables are. We can track them inside the Bill.com system. We can set up recurring invoicing that, again, all will sync to our master accounting system, it helps us to really look at how what we can pull forward and really catch things when they start to go maybe past terms and let us know to make that gentle collection phone call. So it's interesting. So not only has it been helpful in times six months to a year ago, you anticipate it being actually even more valuable now for right now, forecasting yeah. and having a, a better real-time view on what's going on above the receivables exactly. and the payable side. And your side. whole team has that view, Joshua. I mean, it's not, yeah. it's, it, it can be the senior accountant that's working with us. Hey, check everything $500. Give us a list of what you think can be cut out. And then the next approver, you're at $2,500. You start looking at what's inside of, of this that you can cut. So yeah, I mean, it's always been very helpful, but it, especially now where you have that ability to collaborate, talk to one another right on the you know, communicate with one another on the platform and have good visibility into what your, ob your cash obligations are going to be really important. Excellent. That's really, really valuable. So we talked about what a beginner should be thinking about when they're just getting yes. started with bill.com. We talked about when you run into some veteran users at maybe some conferences or, or networking and, uh, they're, you're trying to figure out like what would add value to them at a whole different level. Right. We right. talked about the big mistakes that people tend to make around uh, timing and uh, getting getting sloppy with reconciliations. And then we talked about overall like what it means to a company like Early Growth Financial Services to be able to use Bill.com as part of its core tech stack toolkit for clients and and the the, the services and value around that. Yeah, so it's been it's been super super helpful. Anything else about Bill.com you think that would be especially helpful for our our viewers for our listeners to hear? Uh, I, I just the you know the the capability now to make international payments is also intriguing, right? That expands the the usability of the platform. It expands the capability of a lot of our clients to have a really a really integrated, simple, manageable, simple quote unquote, manageable one stop place for looking at every payment that goes out, right? So that's a really nice feature. Um, I'm just looking forward to Bill.com advancing certain capabilities. Um, you know, we rely a lot on our on our really good vendors to always bring more functionality in addition to the good work to built-in workflow. Really good functionality, added functionality, things like you know um, AI, you know um, OCR, the ability to read documents, right, and help us make classifications to save a lot of the manual work so we can focus on the analytical work. So we very heavily rely on our on our good vendor systems, um, and that's a lot of the reasons we choose them. Actually, is you know how much are they going to continue to advance this capability the way we need them to? So that becomes very important for us, and that's something we absolutely look at. You know how are they leveraging AI, rule setting, OCR? You know the ability to remove the um, the things that machines do really well that and so that humans can really focus on 
client facing issues and, and you know, whether that's cash flow management or growth. So that makes a ton of sense. So it's basically freeing up your team to be able to move up the value chain, provide more outsourced CFO services, more analytics, exactly. more recommendations, more consulting around helping them that actually grows their business as opposed to just taking care of coding. Exactly. And that's where the, that's where the value comes, Joshua. I mean, a client doesn't, it, paying a vendor timely is important because, you know, your vendors are really good, one of your very important stakeholders, right, or team members. But, you know, when it's giving strategic advice, like right now on the CARES Act or whatever it is, that can sometimes be invaluable, right? And so to have a system that can take care of the, of the background stuff for you and free up your time to focus on that, that's just, I mean, it's a win-win all the way around. This has been super helpful. What's the best way for our viewers, our listeners to learn more about you, to learn more about early growth financial services? Well, great. Just we're, we're on, you can go to our website. My email is Tina at earlygrowth.com. Feel free to ask, you know, connect with me to any questions. And of course they can contact you too, Joshua, because I always look forward to talking with you. I look forward to speaking with you as well. Thanks so much. This has been super helpful. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of the AI and Accounting Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at blog.vic.ai or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube.